Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading for our sermon text this morning as we are going to be together in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. It's good to be back in the pulpit after a couple of weeks off. Let's see if I remember how to do this. <laughs> Colossians 3, 1 to 4. This is God's holy word for us today. God's word says, If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. What an amazing passage of Scripture. Let's ask God to bless our time in his word this morning. May the unfolding of your word this morning give us your eternal light, O oh God, so that we might be instructed in your wisdom. Give us, we pray, eyes to see and ears to hear, in power we plead the preaching of your word that we might receive it with faith and with eagerness to obey. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen. Okay, so it's been a couple of weeks since I've been with you. It's really excellent to be, to be back in the pulpit. I remember when I was in high school and our, our pastor, I actually got to fill in two weeks while our pastor was gone. I was just a college, I said, I said high school, I was, a col I was in college, I was home for the summers like an intern, and I got to preach two weeks in a row. I never got to do two sermons in a row, so I'm sure it was not worth listening to or recording at that time in my life. Thankfully, those tapes have been destroyed. But I remember the pastor, when he got back in the pulpit, he just was like, ah, my pulpit, and it was smaller than this, and he hugged it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, because um, this isn't really my, my pulpit though it is very lovely. It's been here a lot longer than I have. So it's not my pulpit, but it is really, really uh, excellent to be back with you uh, this morning. And even though I was home, I did miss you. Well, let me remind you all where we've been. Ooh, I said you all. Y'all, let me remind, <laughs> let me remind y'all. Ooh, I don't like that. Let me remind everybody <laughs> where we've been. Before I, before I left. So, we are doing a series. If you recall, we did a whole series for the weeks of Lent on repentance. And for the weeks after Easter, remember there's 40 days before Easter, or there's a 40-day period on the church calendar after Easter, the Easter season, Easter tide, it's sometimes called. And during this period of Easter, which we're almost to the end of, we have been looking at not repentance, but the life that comes after you repent. The born-again life, or as I've called this series, the resurrection life. Jesus rises from the dead, and then we rise from the dead in and with Him when we're born again. And so what we've been talking about is the nature and the role of the new birth in our Christian life. And here's what we've seen so far. We've done three sermons so far, and we did all three of those in April, right after Easter. So the first was from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And what we talked about was how our new birth is a resurrection life. When we're born again, we have our own Easter moment where we come out of the spiritual tomb. We're raised from spiritual death to new spiritual life so that it wasn't just Jesus coming out of his tomb, but spiritually we are called forth out of our tomb, and that's just a little anticipation of the final resurrection when we come out of our graves just like he did. So the new birth is, is us rising from the dead on the inside, and then at the second coming we rise from the dead on the outside. This is the great Christian hope. And so that first sermon was about our glorious hope, our future hope. It's rooted in Christ's resurrection. 
And by getting plugged into his resurrection, we have our own spiritual new birth. And from there, we've been looking at the nature of the new birth, and that was the next sermon. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, we looked at the necessity of the new birth, where Jesus says, you must be born again. You can't see the kingdom, you can't enter the kingdom. You must be born again if you want to be saved, if you want to enter the kingdom. And Jesus concludes that section by talking about the Wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound, but you don't see the wind, and you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. And that's what it's like to watch a person get born again. And we mentioned how we like to ask questions about the freedom of the will, but Jesus in that passage is talking about the freedom of the wind. God's Spirit blows where it wishes, and we don't hear the sound of it. We don't see, or we do hear the sound, but we can't see the Spirit, the Holy Spirit tangibly with our physical eyes doing stuff. But when you see the leaves rustling on the trees, you know the wind is blowing. You don't see the wind, you see what the wind moves. And likewise, you don't see the Holy Spirit, you see what the Holy Spirit moves. And if you see faith, if you see conversion, if you see new life happening, that's not that person making the wind blow. That's the Spirit of God making that person into a new creature right before your eyes. Just like the rustling of the leaves doesn't make the wind blow, we don't make the Spirit move. The Spirit moves us. And that's why He gets all the glory. And that's why we are at His mercy. The new birth is a work of God first to last. Salvation is a work of God first to last. That's why we must be born again. Because we do not have the power or the ability, or even the interest before God gets a hold of us. Then we saw the third sermon that we've looked at in the series so far, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. If John 3 is about the necessity of the new birth, 1 John 3 is about the nature of the new birth, and it's about you becoming a new creature on the inside. It's about God turning you into one of His offspring where you actually become a member of the family and you start to bear the family resemblance. You start to look like Jesus, because that's your elder brother, Paul says, and you start to look like the Father because you're being raised by Him. He raises you from the dead and then He raises you as His own child. That's the nature of the new birth. It's taking on the family resemblance, looking like Christ, having that spiritual DNA in us, that gives us a new moral and spiritual nature. So that's where we've been so far. And notice we're going in order. The need, the necessity to be, to, to be born again, then the nature of that new birth once we have it, and now we're at the next stage. What follows? What comes next? That's where we are today. We come to the next phase in the role of the new birth and the role it plays in the Christian life. It's the commencement of the Christian life, but it's also the continuation of the Christian life. Let me say it like this. Our new life is a resurrection life. We are born again by an infusion of Jesus' resurrection life. And that life gives us a new spiritual nature. And that new nature gives a new quality, a new character to our lives in this world. The life of Jesus is born again in you. The life of Jesus lives again in you and is reproduced in you. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, It's not I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. The life of the earthly Jesus, which was one of perfect virtue and character, spiritual and moral perfection, all His holy heavenly innocence, and purity and godliness, that begins to get worked out in you as you begin to get conformed into the image of Christ. He is living out His own life once again in you. The new birth entails new growth. The new birth entails new growth. You don't just get born again and stay stagnant. The new life grows and matures 
in you as you walk with the Lord. And that lifelong process, we have a word for in theology, that lifelong process of growing and maturing in your Christian life, that's called sanctification. And the way you get sanctified, we have another word for discipleship. Increasing in your capacity to be a faithful follower of Jesus. And as you get better and better and are changed more and more into a true, devout disciple of Jesus, you're being sanctified. You're being made more and more holy. Sanctification is one of those $5 technical theology words that has a simple meaning. And the simple meaning is we are dying more and more to sin and we are living more and more to righteousness. Becoming less sinful gradually, step by step and inch by inch and day by day and year after year. It's a lifelong process. Gradually dying more and more to our sin and at the same time coming to life more and more to godliness, holiness, righteousness in our Christian lives. We're being sanctified. In our passage this morning, Paul captures this idea when he says that we are raised with Christ and that our life is inseparable from His. In Colossians 3, 1 to 4. In light of this reality, Paul tells us how to live a resurrected life. Or in other words, how to approach the sanctification process. Paul's point in our passage is that a resurrection life that is being sanctified is a life that is progressively in heaven with Christ. A life that is progressively in heaven with Christ. And I know I've heard this language before, maybe you've heard it before, where we talk about dying and going to heaven. Sometimes we use it as sort of a euphemism for being really excited about something. Like, man, that, that, uh, that concert was so good, it's like I died and gone to heaven. We use this sort of language, died and gone to heaven. And we think of it as this sort of, you know, when you die, you go to heaven. And of course, that's right. But Paul's point here is that you've already done that. You've already died and gone to heaven if you're born again. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And in verses 1 and 2, he just said Christ is at God's right hand in heaven. So you've died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God up there in heaven. So in Christ, you've already died and gone to heaven. You've already been raised with Christ. And here's the point about sanctification. We don't go to heaven all at once. We go to heaven piece by piece, a little at a time. And that's sanctification. Parts of us are constantly in the process of going to heaven. Our life in Christ is secure. Our whole life is secure in Christ we are raised with Him. We are connected to Him. We're united to Him. Our life is hidden with Christ in God, in heaven. And we, while we live down here, we are progressively being sanctified, which means we are progressively more and more having parts of us go to heaven. And Paul gives us a progression of how we go to heaven little by little. So let's look at the passage and see how he unpacks this. The first part of us, Paul says, that needs to go to heaven in sanctification after the new birth is our mind. Our mind. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, when Paul says, if then, 
This is a rhetorical move. If it's true that you've been raised with Christ, then this should be true as well. What he really means is since. Since you have been raised from the dead, because you are already alive and raised with Christ, what should you do? And he gives us two things to do. Seek and set. Seek and set. He says, seek the things that are above where Christ is, and set your minds on things that are above. Seek things above and set your mind on things above. Send your mind to heaven. The mind needs to ascend off this earth, away from this life, and needs to be in heaven. Now, as soon as I say that, you think of an old, an old cliche that says, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Right? If you're always looking at heaven, you're going to run into a wall. Right? You need to be looking at where you're going in life so you, you can see straight. And if you're always looking up, you're going to bump into things and make a mess. You'll be no earthly good. But Paul doesn't believe that cliche. Paul says you need to be more heavenly minded so that you can be more earthly good. He means your mind and your ambitions, what you set your mind on and think about, and then what you seek, what you desire, your ambitions in life, and what you meditate on and dwell on and think about ought to be consumed with Christ and the things of Christ. That doesn't mean you can't think about your job and you shouldn't think about your friends and you shouldn't think about you know, daily routines and think about your kids. And, like, it doesn't mean any of that stuff, right? You have, to be, you have to be mindful of earthly things. That's right. But Paul wants you this morning to know you need to carve out time, important time, sufficient time, to let your mind dwell on Christ. To not, to not be able to say, this week I didn't think about Jesus at all. Well, no, that's not true. I did pray before my meal for five seconds, and I said in Jesus' name. But other than that, I haven't thought about Jesus at all this week. It's like I've had nothing to do with him. Let that not be said of us, where we go a whole week, and all we, the only time we mention Jesus or think about Jesus is how to end a prayer before a meal. But make time, important time, to set your mind on things above, to think of Christ and the things of Christ, to make time, sufficient time, quality time to open up the word and let your mind be consumed with heavenly things for a space and notice the refreshing and the change that can happen in your heart and in your mind and your soul if we give our minds over to the things of Christ and we think about him during our day and during our week if you related all the other earthly things you need to think about to Christ, what a difference that might make in how we respond to a difficult situation or the kind of calm and peace we might have in a very stressful day. Because Christ will be at the center of our thoughts. We'll have time for Him. We'll have minds that are set upon Him. And then we'll begin to seek the things that are above, to seek heavenly things, the things of Christ. You know, Paul says in Romans 8, 5 and 6, if you set your mind on the things of the flesh, that's going to bring death. But if you set your mind on the things of the Spirit, that's going to bring life and peace. Set your minds on the things of the Spirit, the things of Christ, and see the change that will happen on the inside. Christ will have more of your mind, more of your concentration, more of your focus, more of your attention. You'll be more in heaven in your mind where Christ is and that will make all the earthly difference. You'll begin to see your ambitions change and your goals and motives will change. They'll begin to be conformed to what Christ wants. His kingdom and His will be done, not mine. Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, to this earth, but be conformed. Rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That will make all the difference. He, Paul says in, this, in these two verses that Christ is seated at God's right hand. And don't miss that idea of being seated at the right hand of God. That is kingdom language. That Christ is seated, not just in like some chair that God pulled out from the back. Seated doesn't mean like in a sidecar <laughs> on some motorcycle. 
No, he's seated on a throne. This is Ascension Sunday where Christ is seated, think enthroned upon a majestic throne of majesty where he is Lord of all at God's right hand, the highest place imaginable, right next to God with all power and authority in heaven and on earth. So what, what we're being told here is not just think about Jesus in a general way, but think about him as being king and Lord and sovereign who is for you, who intercedes for you before the Father. And begin to think about him in his kingly power who is, who is there to guard you and protect you, who is there to vanquish all your enemies and to give you peace. Think about Jesus in his office as your king, in his offices of mediator interceding for you, in his office as priest pleading the blood of his cross in your behalf. Think about him there before the Father in all the capacities that he has for, the, for you before the Father as your king and priest, as the prophet, mediator. He's at God's right hand for your good, for your eternal good. Trust him. Trust his promises. Trust his power. That he is there for you and not against you. And because he's there next to you, nothing can separate you from the love of God because it's yours in Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God and he will not let you lose that life. Think about Christ and who he is there at God's right hand for you and seek the things of his kingdom. Like Jesus says in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all this other earthly stuff, God will take care of that. Doesn't mean you, you can neglect duty and responsibility and, and not use wisdom. And right, it's in the midst of living daily life, let the life of Christ course through you. And how do you start doing that? Set your mind on things above and set your heart on things above. Seek and set Christ where he is in heaven for you. Not the things on earth, but the things that God gives you for earth. We live our earthly lives with a heavenly focus, with our attention on Christ and his kingdom. Do that, Christian, and notice the changes that will happen in your heart and in your mind and the changes that will happen in your character and that will happen in your relationships and happen in your life. You'll be more in heaven with Christ. That takes us to the next thing Paul tells us to do. As your mind goes more and more to heaven, your daily living will go more and more to heaven as a result. Look at verse 4. When Christ who is your life appears. Just stop there. When Christ who is your life Christ is your life, Paul says. Christ himself is your life. Christ is your life because he is the reason that you were born again. Christ is your life because he is what you live for now. Christ is your life because he is living in you and through you. Now, Paul doesn't expand on these things in these four verses, but in Paul's writings, he does. And the rest of Scripture has a lot to say about these things. The reason you are born again, that's verse 1. He says that you are raised with Christ. If then or since you have been raised with Christ, his resurrection, as we said in the review earlier, is the reason you have a spiritual resurrection. He's the reason you're born again. He does for you spiritually what he did physically for Lazarus. He calls you by name and tells you to come out of your grave and you live. And that life is faith and trust and confidence in God and a desire for Christ and trusting Scripture and seeing the beauty of the cross and seeing God for who he is. The lights come on. You have eyes that live again. You have a heart that beats again. You have faith that burns He's the reason you're born again. He is the one you've been raised with by the power of God. He's also your life now because of 
He's what you live for. If we go further in the passage on to verse 5, he just said in verse 4, Christ is your life. And then he says, as a result of that, verses 5 and following, he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry, on account of these the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene, talk from your mouth, and he goes on from there. Because you have died and have been raised with Christ, therefore put the earthly stuff in you to death. This isn't just your mind going to heaven where you dwell on Christ and think about Him, but this is where you embrace not only heavenly mindedness, but heavenly living. Put to death earthly living so that heavenly living begins to be exemplified in your life. You are living like people from the future. You are living a new heavens, new earth kind of life in the present evil age. You have been raised from the dead. Everybody else is still dead in their sins. You are, a, you are this peculiar creature from the future that's just been dropped in the middle of this evil age. And this is why Christians stand out and look strange and peculiar. And, and this is why the Bible describes us as aliens and strangers and foreigners in this world, in this age, because we have been born again, and now we're not just heavenly-minded, but we live in a heavenly way. We live like Christ. Christ is your life because He is now what you're living for. The old is dying, and the new is rising. That's sanctification. Our character is going to heaven a little bit at a time. Christ is your life because He's the reason you were born again. Christ is the life because is your life because He's what you live for. And Christ is your life because Christ now lives in you. Again, Paul says this in Galatians 2, 20. I'll read the whole verse this time. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ lives in each of us if we have been born again. And our job, our job is to let that life be lived out through us. And we do it by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. As we get more and more conformed to him, he is our life. He is our life. And then Paul concludes this way. Not only do we have heavenly minded, not only do we have heavenly living, but finally heavenly appearing. As our minds go more and more to heaven, our earthly lives go more and more to heaven as we are further and further sanctified. And one day, Christian, one day the process will end and we will be completely in heaven, completely in heavenly glory, mind, soul, and body. Again, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, and His appearing is His return when He comes back, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you, Christian, you also will appear with Him in glory. Christ has a second coming. He's returning from heaven. We have a second coming where we leave our tomb behind. We're going to heaven. The mind goes to heaven. Our lives and character follow what we set our minds on. And then the body goes in the grave. But the body is still connected to Christ. When we bury someone we love, 
That person is that person's body there in the tomb, cremated or not. That person is still united to the living, risen Jesus. And Jesus doesn't leave that thing behind. He has a second coming, and so do you. He comes from above, you come from below. And we who are alive and remain, we have an appearing as well. But that's where we are transformed in the blink of an eye. We get our resurrection bodies without going through death. That's what that is. We have a second appearing. You have a glorious future hope. And this is why what we saw last, last time we were together, 1 John chapter 3, John says, We are children of God now, but what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. If you didn't just, if you didn't just get shivers, <laughs> you're not paying attention. You will be like Jesus. You'll be as new, as glorified, as whole as he is. God's not going to start the process of sanctification and then let it fall at the end. He who began a good work in you, he will finish it because he's faithful. And so we in this life live for him with our minds set on a heavenly horizon that will be ours in Christ. We will appear with him in glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Final glory and final salvation is the end goal of your sanctification now. We're going to heaven a little at a time, day by day and inch by inch, sometimes scratching and clawing, but we're going. And when he appears, he's going to wrap it up, and we will be with him in glory. What is hidden will be revealed. The new birth ties your life to Jesus, and it's inseparable. Because he lives, you will live. You will be with him, and you will be like him. So Christian, let us do what Paul says in this text, clinging and trusting to these glorious gospel promises. Seek and set Christ as the center of your life. The only ones going to heaven in the end are the ones who have been going all along. So let's get going. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the glorious hope that we have that is absolutely rock solid and secure in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you that nothing can separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, Lord, help us be merciful to our weaknesses that are so easily distracted and help us to set our minds on Christ, to make him and the things of Christ part of our day day in and day out, to set aside time, quality time, to go for a walk or get outside or open the Bible or do, do what we need to do to reconnect with Christ so that he might be the center. Increase our hunger for prayer. Increase our love of Scripture. Increase our ambition to know Christ, to see him for who he is, to be like him. And through that process, continue to sanctify us. Take us more and more to heaven in our daily lives, in our minds, in our wills, in our character. And ultimately, Lord, help us to set our hopes on the heavenly horizon as we look for Christ to appear again. And we rejoice in the hope and the peace and the comfort and confidence that we will appear with him because he is our life. Oh, do these things in us, we pray, and we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.